is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged today to have Matthew Bowman uh, on the program. And I'm going to read his bio on the back of his latest book that we're going to be discussing. Matt is Associate Professor of Religion and History and Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. His books include The Mormon People, The Making of an American Faith. And today we're going to be discussing his new book, The Abduction of Betty and Barney Hill, Alien Encounters, Civil Rights, and the New Age in America. And for those of you who are watching on the YouTube channel rather than uh, listening just to the audio, that's uh, the cover of the book. And it's a wonderful, great book. Um, I got it. I pre-ordered. And it. I love the thing I love about Amazon is that they get it to you the day it comes out. So that was awesome. So, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. It, it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a great book. Um your background is in uh, religious studies. You've done some work in uh, the history of Mormonism. So an initial question is, as a scholar of religion, you know, this one of my frustrations is the paranormal, uh, and I know you're not looking at it per se in terms of UFO abduction, but it's in that category. Um, it's still largely fringe in terms of the academy. So as a scholar of religion, what made you decide to take this up? And were you at all worried about how it might impact your, your <laughs> academic career? Yeah, those are great questions. And I'll start with the first one. Um, I am particularly interested in religion in the 20th century. I'm interested in what happens to religion um, in the era of what scholars often call the secularization hypothesis. This is the idea that gets popular in the academy in the 60s and 70s that as science and rationality and technology advance, religion will necessarily recede. Um, that's been largely disproven, I think, both by academics but also simply by events that surround us. And it's been replaced, I think, with this notion that um, in this period, in the late 20th century, the mid to late 20th century, what actually happens to religion is not that it recedes, it's that it transforms, um, it evolves. Institutional metrics of religion, that is traditional denominations and the like, both certainly begin to decline, but they are replaced by a lot of other things that we might say look like religion. Um, so I wanted to examine that, and I thought in particular I wanted to examine that with reference to um, what you refer to as the paranormal. Um, this is something really fascinating, um, and another reason why the secularization hypothesis is it's simply incorrect. Um, we might assume, right, that as science and education and uh, rationality and so on and so forth, um, increase in our society, as our society becomes increasingly rationalized, the belief in these sorts of things would decline, but they don't. Um, there was a recent Gallup poll um, from 2020 that showed that 41% of Americans believe that UFOs have connections to extraterrestrial civilizations, um, right? Why is that? Um, how does belief in these sorts of things and UFOs and ghosts and channeling um, and crystal magic and all these sorts of things, how does it survive and persist in the modern era? That was the question I was initially interested in. Um, and I was examining all sorts of possible case studies that I might do to explore that. Um, and as I was digging around, I learned that Kathleen Marvin, who is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill, who wrote her own really exhaustive book on the case called Captured, um, had donated the Hill's papers to the University of New Hampshire. Um, it has only been in the last 10 or 15 years um, that they have landed there. And as far as I could tell, you know, of course, the Hill case is, is famous. It's one of the kind of quintessential UFO cases in America. And it's been treated by scholars who study that sort of stuff but almost always with reliance only on John Fuller's 19th book about the case. Um, no other scholar that I could tell had looked at these papers. And I thought, well, there is, you know, there is a new archive. And as a historian, you, know, you love it when you discover um, an archive that other historians haven't dug through yet. So I thought I could do something new with the case. And when I went to New Hampshire to look at this paper collection, I found it was as rich as I could have hoped for, um, just full of letters, short autobiographies that the Hills wrote, um, all sorts of papers they have collected about themselves, um, you know, other reports and, and newspaper accounts and the like. Um, and it was certainly basis enough for the book. 
Um, to your second question, uh, the question about, you know, dealing with a sort of fringy topic, that is actually one reason why I decided to go with a university press and um, with a press that would review um, and lend, I think, that kind of sense of probably credibility um, to the book. There is, I think, an increasing number of scholars who, who take UFOs seriously um, and who want to write about them, but it certainly is, I think, still something that attracts um, eye eyebrow raising, we might say, <laughs> among um, academics. Um, and I think publishing with Yale um, certainly, I hope, gives the books an additional effect. Well, I think you're right about the secularization hypothesis. I mean, even Peter, the late Peter Berger, uh, who you know was one of the primary proponents. He mm -hmm. he moved away from it. He abandoned yeah. it. And his mind. I, I think there's a yeah. I think there's a there was a book that came out within the last few months by a couple of scholars that is pushing that again. That mm -hmm. we're in position. And I think that what spurs that is the rise of the nuns. And when you see media reporting, it's largely presented as a rise of atheism, which is a part of it. But as I look yeah. at the, the data, if you look at it and parse it out, it, it appears to be a shift away from institutional forms mm -hmm. of religion towards more individualized, a personal quest, more eclectic. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. This is um, what Wade Clark Roof, who was a really eminent sociologist of religion who passed away a few years ago, right? He, he said um, this is the rise of, of what he called seekerism. Right. And uh, yeah, the nuns are not atheists. Um, if you look at, you know, if you, as you say, if you break down that survey data and dig into it, a large percentage of them still say they pray. Um, they say they believe in a higher power of some sort. Um, they're engaged in religious practice or spiritual practices of some sort, um, as you say, affiliated from institutions. And many of them, and I think this is very interesting, right? Many of them are moving into practices and beliefs of the sort. Um, that we might call free. That is to say, tarot, right? Tarot is experiencing a boom in popularity. Astrology, right? A lot of these traditional, um, I mean, to use a you know, kind of overused label, kind of like cult practices are actually growing in popularity in the United States. Um, so it's simply, I think, incorrect to say that they're atheists. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, this is a case from 1961. I would assume that most people watching and listening to this podcast would have some familiar familiarity with it, but in case they don't, can you just kind of summarize for folks uh, the, the the case and the experience and report of the Hills? Yeah, absolutely. So Betty and Barney Hill um, were an interracial couple. Barney was black, Betty was white. Uh, they were living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1961. They had been married the year before that. It was a second marriage for both. They were roughly 40 years of age. Um, they decided in September 1961 to take a belated honeymoon. Um, they drove to Montreal, Canada, um, and cut the trip short because there was a approaching major storm. On September 19, 1961, they were trying to get home. Um, it was late at night. They crossed the Canadian-American border um, late in the evening. And at some point, it's unclear precisely when, but probably between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., um, they were driving... Um, in remote central New Hampshire, um, and they saw a light in the sky. And the light began to behave strangely. It, um, they said that it followed them, you know, it was swooping down, rising up. Um, Betty said, memorably, uh, she said it looked like a falling star moving upward. They stopped the car several times um, and got out and looked at it. And the last time um, they stopped, Barney Hill took out his binoculars, looked at the star, um, and was terrified left back in the car and said they're going to trust and they began racing home they arrived home far later than they thought they would based on the time they left Canada. and that seemed to be it um for the moment um however over the next few months um, Betty hill had a series of nightmares um about the light that they saw in the sky. Um, she had nightmares of being kind of captured by small creatures that came from the light. Um, Barney Hill began to experience high degrees of stress. Um, he had an ulcer. Um, he was drinking more than his wife thought wise. And so eventually uh, he consulted a psychiatrist. And after um, some consultation with that person, um, they ended up in the office of the kid named Benjamin. Um, now, it's, I think, important to emphasize Simon was widely 
Um, he was well known in the American psychiatric community. I um, mean, had a long career uh, with the military before going into private practice. He was in his early 60s and was regarded as an expert at hypnosis. In early 1964, um, he met with the Hills multiple times over about three months, separated them and hypnotized them each and asked them about this event. And they both ended up telling a story um, in which the craft landed on the road in front of them. Um, then small creatures came from the craft, took them in to the craft and subjected them to medical experiment. Um, Betty Hill's story was very, very long and quite elaborate. Barney's was a bit briefer, but on the main, um, the stories were quite similar. They concluded their hypnosis um, in the early summer of 1964. Benjamin Simon told them um, that he did not believe this actually happened. Um, he told them this is common under hypnosis. Um, recovered memories are quite often confabulated. And that is, as he put it, memories that might reflect your emotional truth rather than literal. But Betty and Barney disagreed. Um, they had these memories. They were certain that this had happened to them. And over the next few years, um, their case got into the media and became famous as the first case of what we might call alien abduction today. They were not the first Americans who said they had met um, extraterrestrials. There were a number of people before them who said that. Um, but they were the first to lay out the story of abduction as it is almost always repeated in the media. That is with um, you know lost memories, um, lost time, um, small gray creatures with large heads and slanting gray eyes, um, medical experimentation. All of these tropes that are so common in abduction literature today um, begin with. No, I, I first encountered this when I was very young, growing up in the nineteen seventies. Um, there wasn't a paranormal documentary that I didn't try to, to mm -hmm. digest. And I saw a made-for-TV, uh, the UFO incident. Uh, I, I watched that when it first aired to prepare for our conversation. I rewatched it again on uh, YouTube. And then later in the 80s, I tracked down uh, John Fuller's book on the subject. But that had been my only uh, exposure to the treatment of the materials. As you write in your book, um, there are some problems with, with Fuller's uh, story, with his reconstruction. And... And this happens all the time as human beings relate experiences. There are variations in reporting over time. So that, that that's not necessarily a negative critique of the hills. But what other sources are you, you talked about this archive that you found? What types of sources are available and how do they shed light on the hills experience? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, so I begin, of course, with the hills papers. And these papers consist of a, a wide array of letters, um, audio autobiographical sketches, um, the beginnings. And Betty Hill eventually did write a memoir called A Common Sense Approach to UFOs. There's a number of drafts of that memoir in this collection, um, letters between them and many, many other UFO investigators, letters between them and various representatives of the media, letters between them and just common Americans who wrote to them asking um, for advice, for insight, things like that. Um, and a lot of letters with two figures in particular who are quite important. The first is a man named Walter Webb. Um, Walter Webb was an astronomer and um, a volunteer with NICAP, um, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, which was the most prominent citizen-led UFO group in the United States in the 1960s. He interviewed the Hills a number of times and wrote a series of reports um, on their case, and they became friends, and he and the Hills traded a lot of letters over the next 10 years or so after the case. Um, and then letters with a man named Robert Holman, who was another NICAP investigator, um, who visited with the Hills initially in 1961, but then re-enters their life in the late 1960s, um, and they, they share a lot with him. So that was a really strong foundation. After that, um, the next most valuable paper collection was that of John Fuller. Now, Fuller was a journalist um, who comes into contact with the Hills in 1965. Um, and he interviews them both. He interviews Benjamin Simon, and then he wrote a book called The Interrupted Journey about their case, um, which became, as I noted earlier, more or less the, the kind of seminal tome about the case, the thing that everyone went to when they wanted to learn about that. Hill's papers are at Boston University. 
or I'm sorry, not Hill. Uh, John Fuller's, I'll say that again. John Fuller's papers are at Boston University. Um, they consist of a lot of letters um, between him and the Hills and him and Benjamin Simon, and also several drafts of the book, and also, I think, most critically, um, transcripts of the interviews that he gave um, with the Hills and with Benjamin Simon. And comparing those interview transcripts, which I've not seen any other historian um, do before, reveals that he um, altered what they remembered and what they told him several times. It's, it's impossible, I think, to know why he did this, um, it may simply have been sloppiness. He, he wrote this book incredibly quickly, um, uh, or it may have been intentional. I think maybe there are some pieces um, of those. There's a, a number of other papers of the Hill scattered around the country as well. Um, I want to mention the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago, um, run by Mark Rodiger, um, who is very, very helpful to me. Um, the Center for UFO Studies has a lot of Hill-related material. Um, perhaps some less about the hills themselves, but a great deal about some of the UFO investigators who surround them, like Alan Hynek or Stanton Friedman. Um, there is a number of hill papers at the International UFO Museum and Archive, which is, of course, in Roswell, New Mexico. Um, there are some letters between Betty Hill and one of her friends, Marjorie Fish, there, um, and a few other places as well. Um, but yeah, I, as you can tell, I went to a number of archives <laughs> and spent about two and a half years doing research for this book. Wow, that's great. Now, as I look at the field on, on the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal in general, there tends to be, I, I would characterize two major camps, that what I would call the true believer, uh, who's in, in the case of UFOs, these are extraterrestrial vehicles and so on, and then the skeptic or the debunker uh, type of thing. When I started uh, co-editing with Daryl Katarine our book on the paranormal and pop culture, I told him going into it, I'm not really interested in either of those positions. I'm interested in what does the phenomenon and the belief in these things tell us about American religiosity and spirituality and so on. And your book seems to fit within this. So how did you how did you come to this analytical framework? And can you spell that out a little bit for folks so they know what perspective you're bringing to it? Yeah, absolutely. So th this is also a really hotly debated question in religious studies in the academy as well. That is, how should academics approach religion? Um, and for insiders, that is, people who are involved in any given religious tradition, or people who are involved, um, in this case, right, in UFO culture in America, it does tend to break down in that way, right? People who are advancing um, belief in these things and people who want to debunk that. Um, most academics who study, well, who study religion, um, but also who study um, the paranormal, I think, would fall in that third camp that you say. That is to say, we want to take this phenomenon seriously, which is to say, right, we recognize, as I mentioned earlier, 41% um, of Americans believe that UFOs are extraterrestrial in some way, whether that be from another planet or perhaps from another dimension, right? There's the interdimensional hypothesis as well as the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Um, but what I am primarily interested in is why? Why is that? Why do so many people believe in this um, as opposed to believing in other things? Right? Why, why have UFOs kind of seized our national imagination the way that they have? And I, I want to respect that belief. Right, to say there are, there are valid reasons why people might believe in this. Um, retreating to words like crazy or foolish or deluded, right, are not actually explanations. So it's our words that you can use to avoid having to give an explanation. Um, and yeah, and so I wanted to kind of take the hills really seriously and to be empathetic to them. Um, that is to say, like, I want to understand what it was like to be who they were coming out of this interview. And then this is, I think, something fascinating with the Hills, that they came out of this interview with Benjamin Simon, their hypnotic um, consultations, really believing and with memories that this had happened to them. They were not lying. Um, they were not making this up. Um, they had memories of this. Um, what did that do to them? What did that do to their experiences in America in the 1950s? Um, how did they first come to that belief? And second, then, how did that belief shape their lives? What, uh, with that idea, that analytical framework in mind, um, there are a number of different things that you, you look at in the book. Uh, 
um, in terms of their context and the things that they went through, the 1960s counterculture, uh, racial considerations, uh, they're an interracial couple, their religious background is Unitarians. Can, can you talk to some of that? How did th how did those things and their social and personal context, how does that intersect with their experience? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think I'll start with, well, first, right, one of the major themes of the book is how they are in many ways a microcosm for the collapse of trust in government that happens in the United States in what historians sometimes call the long 1960s. The long 1960s being the period uh, between the Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court decision in 1954, the resignation of Richard Nixon in 1974 after the Watergate scandal. Um, in 1954, a very, very high percentage of Americans said they trusted the federal government to do the right thing most or all of the time. And depending on the poll you look at, it's somewhere between 65 and 85 percent, um, which are just kind of unfathomably high numbers um, for those of us today, living today. Um, by the resignation of Richard Nixon, that had fallen to less than 50 percent. Um, and I think um, there's a lot going into this kind of crisis of trust in government, but I think the rise of um, what we might call UFO conspiracy culture, um, which begins in the 1950s, um, particularly with the writings of Donald Kehoe, who was the president of, well, sometimes the president of the of NICAP, the organization I mentioned earlier, um, and who is the first major figure to say that the federal government is, knows more about UFOs than it is. Um, Kehoe wrote a number of books making this accusation in the early 1950s, and at that point, he was in some ways trying to avoid in the wilderness. But by the 1970s, that was the default position of most UFO believers in the country. Um, it was simply an assumption that the government knew more about this than they were letting on. And I was interested in how Betty and Barney Hill, who were, before their encounter, um, advocates for big government. They were New Deal liberals in a lot of ways, people who supported big government, who thought big government could solve problems that you know, private industry could not, um, who shared that confidence in government that many other Americans did. Um, Betty Hill was from a union household. Um, she had been voting for Democrats her entire life. Um, Barney Hill was involved with the civil rights movement. And particularly, well, what we might call, you know, historians often refer to the black freedom movement by which we mean not only the civil rights movement, that is the group of black people um, who often followed Martin Luther King in arguing that the federal government could do work to end racial discrimination in America, passing laws um, that using the state to try to end racism was a good thing to do. But the black freedom movement also includes people like Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam who did not trust um, who argued instead for kind of black separatism, right? To say, we need to build our own communities. We cannot trust a government that's run by white people. Arnie Hill was firmly in the first camp. That is, he was one of those who believed that the federal government had a role and could be trusted to help end racial discrimination in America. By the end of the 1960s, the Hills are, are quite um, and you would see this in, in Betty's writings. Now, Barney Hill uh, tragically dies young in 1969, um, but, it, but particularly after his death, um, Betty is very much um, skeptical of what the government is doing. He comes to believe, right, um, that the government knows more about this than they are letting on. Um, she's writing in her autobiography at this point um, that she doesn't trust anyone who comes to her from the government to ask her what's going on. Um, she knows that the government is hiding things, that sort of thing. Um, so this is one way right, in which I see the Hills story as a microcosm in some ways of what's happening in America in the 19th and it very much comes to shape how they understand their own encounter. By the 1970s, right, Betty has um, made of this encounter another reason to distrust government, um, which is something she's coming to, and it's an issue was coming to already, but the encounter provides fuel for that. And this is true of a number of other things as well. Questions of race, I think, um, the fragmentation of religion, over the course of the 1960s, um, this happens to the Hills as well, and so on and so on. One of the interesting things, uh, surprising things in the book for me, 
is as the Hills uh, aren't satisfied with the reactions they get from the military, from the scientific establishment and so on, medical community uh, through Dr. Simon, they become, you know, they're, they're, they're jaded, uh, but, and, and I expected that, but what surprised me was uh, Betty's reaction to others who would come forward and said they had UFO abduction experiences. M my assumption would have been she would have found some kind of community in that, but she had kind of a skepticism in regards to that as well. Can you touch bases on that a little bit? Yeah, for some. Um, per well, particularly who we're talking about here are Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, right, who become in the 1980s um, prominent investigators of abductions and, and people who are working on framing the abduction narrative, right? Creating this kind of master narrative for what it means to be abducted. Both Hopkins and Jacobs um, advanced the notion that abductions are happening quite, quite often, um, that thousands, tens of thousands of Americans are being abducted, that it's an epidemic in some ways. And they're both using um, the Hills's story as a framework for how this might happen. Um, Betty Hill, now, and remember, of course, by the 1980s, Barney, Barney has passed away. Um, so Betty is on her own at this point. She knows um, Hopkins, at least. Uh, they have met, they've spoken, she's been to his house. Uh, but she is also, I think, firmly in the camp of, um, well, what we, what we might call the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Right, with just the idea that uh, UFOs are coming here from other planets. They are nuts and bolts craft. They are built. Um, they are technology like our technology, only more advanced. So, and she is also a real believer in hypnosis, right? She believes that Simon did hypnosis correctly. That he uncovered their memories and that this might happen with other people as well. She does, over the course of the 1970s, um, meet other people who claim abduction and she takes some of them under her wing. Um, and kind of mentors. When, though, she begins um, hearing more and more about some of the stories that Hopkins is uncovering as he is doing hypnosis on potential abductees, she finds some of what he um, is uncovering unbelievable because it seems too fantastical to her. Um, she specifically refers to a number of cases that Hopkins um, describes in which aliens seem to be popping through walls, right? Or, you, you know, there, there, there's a famous case in New York City where a woman is sleeping in an apartment building and, so, and suddenly aliens kind of just materialize at the foot of her bed and they levitate her out the window to their ship. And this seems to Betty too fantastical, um, in part because I think she is so convinced um, that aliens are simply, you know, beings from other planets with technology that should be understandable to humans. Um, so there is, I think, to, and, and she, she makes this distinction later in her life about, about correctly done hypnosis and incorrectly done hypnosis. Um, about some of what Hopkins is doing is you know, hypnosis badly applied while clinging, I think, to her own hypnosis as hypnosis correctly. And this, I think, reveals um, what simply becomes, you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, a broader division in the UFO community. Uh, between advocates of the interdimensional hypothesis and advocates of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh, you've graciously carved out time in, in the midst of a, a busy day for us to have this conversation. So, and there's all kinds of things that we can talk about. But it seems to me, after reading the book and the way you treat the subject matter in this case, that it is tremendously relevant to today, perhaps even more so than it was for yes. themselves. I mean, Questions of uh, competing authority structures, whether the military, uh, the scientific community, we could add today the media, uh, racial considerations, all kinds of things. What do you hope we, the reader can take away, not only in terms of understanding the hills in their social context, but connecting the dots with similar, perhaps even amplified challenges that we have today with the uh, UAPs or UFOs uh, of great interest on the national stage today. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, my, <laughs> I will say my editor was delighted and she kept sending <laughs> me headlines of, you know, the, this is the newest congressional hearing that's happening. This is the newest video that's been released, so on and so forth. Right. Certainly, right. We're seeing a resurgence of interest. Um, and, and it's really interesting to me, right? Because on the one hand, so here's one narrative we might take from this. 
but I think it is something that we see happening in Betty Hill's life after Barney's death. Um, the political scientist Michael Barcoon has spoken of what he called um, super conspiracy theory um, that emerges, he argues, as mass media becomes increasingly prevalent in the late uh, 20th century. And this is this tendency that we see for stories, for instance, on the one hand of UFOs, right, and, and the sort of UFO, burgeoning UFO culture emerging, and on the other hand, very real events that we know occurred of, of the CIA going somewhat rogue in the post-war period, right, and plotting assassinations and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, right, very, very old stories with, with real anti-Semitic overtones of uh, like um, the international banker elite and, uh, and the Illuminati and various groups like that. What Barkun observes is that as um, mass media becomes increasingly omnipresent, these various strands of conspiratorial belief find each other and they become intertwined. Um, and they and and what emerges is what he calls a new super conspiracy in which all of these things play a part. Um, now he wrote this book you know two decades ago, but it, it seems so prescient to me then um, in a couple of different ways. Right? One is, of course, we've seen in, in emerging kind of mainstream in American politics um, the QAnon conspiracy theory, which is a super conspiracy theory, right? There are, there are people who advocate QAnon who believe in UFOs and who will argue that UFOs are either helping or hindering um, the global cartel. There are, there are QAnon believers um, who believe that Donald and Melania Trump are actually extraterrestrials who are, have been planted on Earth to save us, um, right? So this, this is what's going on in Betty Hill's life in the 1970s. Um, she moved out of simply her belief in her own abduction um, to become a person who monitors black helicopters, who becomes interested in stories of Bigfoot. Um, she even finds kind of ways or, or, or really recognizes um, how Watergate is influencing her life particularly. She sees several times, she says, one of Richard Nixon's men in Portsmouth, um, who maybe seems to be tracking her. Um, so that's, I think, one thing that the Hill story can show us, right, is kind of in real time how this process that Barcoon described um, really comes to pass, um, right, in, in their story in particular. Um, another, though, and another way to describe this, I think, might be this, right? One reason why um, UFO belief becomes so, well, it takes on the cast that it does in America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. That is an increasingly conspiratorial cast, an increasingly anti government cast, um, is the simple fact that it is actually true that there are things going on in the federal government that are hidden from the American population generally. I, I made reference to some of these already, right? The CIA really was plotting to assassinate foreign leaders in the 1960s. 70s. Um, Watergate was a real scandal. And it turns out, as we discovered in 2017, there was a secret Pentagon program to investigate UFOs um, for, for many, many years in the last 20 years, right? And um, so this is to say, right, uh, and it goes back, I think, maybe to a point I made earlier, um, that simply um, looking at UFO belief and labeling it crazy or irrational all of that is, is to be over dismissive and it's to miss all of the ways in which I think UFO belief and some of the conspiratorial belief founded does have grounding um, in our culture. There are real things happening um, that lend credence to these sorts of narratives. And, and thus, as we are trying to understand why UFO belief is so popular um, and does spread so rapidly, right? In some sense, our society has to look at this. Um, these things are near the center of who Americans are as a people, what our culture is politically and socially, um, not simply kind of floating out there in the strangeness all by themselves. Yeah, well, it's you've got a wonderful treatment. Again, I want folks to... Pick up a copy of your wonderful book, The Abduction of Betty and Barney Hill, Alien Encounters, Civil Rights in the New Age in America. Matt, thanks again for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun.
Again, this is the podcast for multi-faith matters. Uh, look at the other podcasts we've got that deal with paranormal issues and religion in America and around the world. And uh, again, my thanks to my guest, Matt Bowman. And thanks to everybody for watching and listening. Until the next episode.